call this to order. This is a special call meeting. Uh, I said it's just a work session. There'll be no business conducted. But what I want to do with what the commissioners is run through this legislation uh, and then add where we've made some changes and taken a bunch of stuff out. I thought it's just easiest to go through maybe one by one. Well, I'm going to start. It's page one on the packet I gave you all the last meeting. And then this, or the, this is the corrections to it. And this is the way most of the cities do it, just because this thing is so hard to, it's kind of cumbersome to deal with. But we'll, we'll start on this. This chapter one is scope and administration. And a lot of this is just filling in the blanks. But section 101.1, the title, is where we have to insert the name of the city. Where the jurisdiction's at, so on your page where it says section 101.1 insert, that's corresponding to that. <coughs> where is page one? I have that it's shuffled. It is. Okay, Okay, then the next one that will be changed is 102.3 and replacing that with everything written on the handout I gave you today, which is the same as the last time. I'm talking about repairs and additions, alterations to structures, or changes of options to be done in accordance with the procedure and provisions of, and they talk about the Kentucky Building Code, the Residential Code, the Kentucky Plumbing Code, Kentucky Heat and Ventilation air conditioning laws, Kentucky Mechanical, and Standards of Safety National Fire Code. And the next one that would be changed is 102.7. And these are including these codes with the ones in Chapter 8. And a lot of this is kind of like I say is housekeeping, though. So. Getting the wording right. Mm -hmm. Getting the wording right. Yeah, the one hundred three point five is under the Department of Property Maintenance Inspection. I'm talking about the fees for activities and services performed by the department and carrying out its responsibilities under this code shall be as indicated in the following schedule. And we are uh, we are not adopting that one because we do not charge fees for those inspections. Now this next one highlighted in pink is one that has been changed since the last meeting. That goes to 104.3, uh, right to entry. The way the sample ordinance is written up it says where it is necessary to make an inspection to enforce the provisions of this code or whenever the code official has a reasonable cause to believe that there exists in a structure or upon a premises a condition in violation of the code and, and it goes on quite a bit about that our the changes we're making here is that the right to entry is not permitted to occupied single single family residential structures or to occupied areas of a multi-family residential structure that's a paragraph I had a big circle on. <laughs> well, that's the one we had talked about and yeah. should have had this in there to begin with. David, of course, code enforcement officer, we've talked quite a bit at length about some of these. It still gives, you know, I don't know that we have a whole lot that's got apartment buildings with public areas in it, but right. and, and something like that generally is not a problem, but I, we wanted to make sure that we're not going to go in somebody's house. Next item is 106.2. Notice of violation. And this is where it gets replaced with a whole lot of stuff. And this is basically what they do now, because David and I have talked about this. Uh, and I'll go through it here real quick. Number one, when a code official, based upon personal observation or investigation, or in our case, a lot of times a complaint has reasonable cause to believe that a violation of, the code, of this code has occurred, he is authorized to issue a notice of violation to the owner of the property. The NOV shall provide a minimum of 10 day time period in which the owner may remedy the violation without further penalty. If the owner fails or refuses to remedy the violation within the time specified or fails to contact the code official with a plan to remedy the violation, a citation will be issued. 
As an additional alternative remedy to the above penalty, any violator who violates any provision of the City Property Maintenance Code and or Nuisance Code and has previously been issued an NOV for violating the same section of this ordinance for the same property may be issued an immediate citation with no grace period. So if it's a second in the 12 month period, they can skip the notice of violation and go straight to a citation. Item three, any NOV issued by the code official for a violation or violations of the property maintenance code shall be in a form prescribed by the city and shall contain, in addition to any other information required by ordinance or rule of the board, the following. Date and time of issuance, the name and address of the person to whom it's issued. Date and time the offense or violation was committed. The facts constituting the offense or violation. The section of the code or number of the ordinance violated. The name of the code official and a statement that if the person fails to remedy the issues outlined in the NOV within the time allowed, a citation will be issued. And item number four, any NOV that is issued for the violation or violations of this code must be served upon the owner of the property or any individual with a legal interest in the property by certified mail, return receipt requested, or personal delivery, or by leaving the notice uh, at the person's usual place of residence with any individual residing there who is 18 years of age or older and who is informed of the contents of the notice. And the number D is if the notice is returned showing that the letter was not delivered, a copy thereof shall be posted in a conspicuous place on or in or about the structure affected by the notice. Number five, if the owner does not respond to the NOV within the specified time given, a citation shall be issued. Any citation issued by the code official for a violation or violations of, the, of this code shall be in a form prescribed by the city and shall contain, in addition uh, to any information required by, and it's basically the same as information that goes in the uh, notice of violation. Civil, but in addition to the civil fine that will be imposed for the violation if the person does not contest the citation, each day the violation exists is considered a separate offense and the civil fine will accrue daily. The maximum civil fine that may be imposed if a person elects to contest the citation the procedure for the person to follow in order to pay the civil fine or to contest the citation, and then the statement that if the person fails to pay the fine set forth in the citation or contest the citation within the time allowed, the person shall be deemed to have waived the right to a hearing before the Code Enforcement Board to contest the citation, and that the determination of that violation shall be final. And then number six, any citations issued for the violation of this, and again, it's sent out by certified mail, return copy, personal delivery, or by leaving. If the notice is showing not delivered, it can be posted in a conspicuous place on the property. Number seven, after issuing a citation to an alleged violator of the property maintenance code, the code official shall notify the board by delivering a citation to the administrative office official designated by ordinance or by the code enforcement board. And then eight, and this is what we do now anyway, but it's kind of the important part. When a citation for a violation or violations of the code is issued, the person to whom the citation is issued shall at minimum have a seven day period, grace period in which to remedy the violation and pay the civil fine or request in writing a hearing before the code enforcement board to contest the citation. If the person fails to respond to the citation within seven days, the person shall be deemed to have waived his right to a hearing to contest the citation and the determination of violation was committed shall be final. In this event, the Code Enforcement Board shall enter a final order determining that the violation was committed and imposing the civil fine set forth in the citation. The notice of final order shall be given to in the same manner as set forth in subsection 4 above. When a final order is issued, the person to whom the final order is issued has 30 days to remedy the violation and pay the civil fine. If no response within the 30 days, the City of Beaverdam shall possess a lien on the real property owned by the person found by a final non-appealable order of the Code Enforcement Board to have committed a violation of the Property Maintenance Code for all fines assessed for the violation and for all charges and fees incurred by the City in connection. Liens shall be uh, noticed to all persons from the time of the bridge recording. It shall bear an interest of 12% per annum, and the liens shall take precedence over all subsequent liens except state, county, school board, and city taxes, and may be enforced by judicial proceedings. If no action is taken within the 30-day period, the city of Beaverdam will file a lien on the property in question. Uh, number nine, when, the hearing, when a hearing before the Code Enforcement Board has been requested, 
The code board shall schedule a hearing not less than seven days before the date set for the hearing. The code enforcement shall notify the person who had requested the hearing of the date, time, and place of the hearing, and the notice of the hearing shall be given in the same manner set forth in number four above. Each case before the court, uh, code enforcement board may be presented by either an attorney selected by the city of Beaverdam or by the code officer, and we always just do the code officer. An attorney may either be counsel to the code enforcement board or may represent the city by presenting a case before the board, but in no case shall the attorney serve in both capacities, which is really kind of redundant for us. Number 11, all testimony of the code enforcement board hearings shall be under oath and shall be recorded. The code enforcement board shall take testimony from the code officials, the alleged offender, and any witnesses to the alleged violation offered by the code officials. Former rules of evidence shall not apply, but fundamental due process shall be observed and govern the proceedings. At the hearing, the code enforcement board shall determine, based on the evidence presented, whether a violation was committed. When the code enforcement board determines that no violation was committed, an order dismissing the citation shall be entered. When the code enforcement board determines that a violation has been committed, it shall issue an order upholding the citation and may order the offender to pay a civil fine or may order the offender to remedy a continuing violation within a specified period of time to avoid the imposition of the fine or both. The board shall under the uh, order the offender upon the finding of the violation to pay in addition to any fine, the cost of hearing, including attorney fees, witness fees, and administrative costs. Number 13, every final order of the code enforcement board shall be reduced in writing, which shall include the date the order was issued. The copy of the order shall be furnished to the person named in the citation. If the person named in the citation is not present at the time the final order is issued, the order shall be delivered to that person by certified mail, return receipt requested, or by personal delivery, or by leaving a copy of the order at that person's usual place of residence with an individual over 18 years of age who is informed of the contents of the order. Number 14, an appeal from any final order issued by the board may be made to the Ohio County District Court within 30 days of the date of the order is issued. The appeal shall be initiated by the filing of a complaint and a copy of the Code Enforcement Board's order in the same manner as any civil action under the rules of civil uh, procedure. The appeal shall be a limited review of the record created before the Board of Code Enforcement Board. If no appeal from a or final order of the Code Enforcement Board is filed within the time period set forth in this section or the violation is not remedied and fines paid, the Code Enforcement Board's order shall be deemed final for all purposes. The city shall possess a lien on real property owned by the persons found by a final non-appealable order of the Code Enforcement Board or by final judgment of the court to have committed a violation. And it goes through the same thing as earlier, uh, about the 12% and uh, lien on the property. 17, in addition to the remedy prescribed in subsection 13 above, a person found to have committed a violation shall be personally responsible for the amount of all fines assessed for the violation and for all charges, fees incurred by the city in connection with the enforcement of the ordinance. That's basically what we do right now. Am I, correct? I mean, that's nothing new. Nothing. But it was not worded in, it was a whole lot different the way they do it in here, and we wanted to keep the same policy and procedure we've always done. So the next change is 106.3. Uh, you see where it's being replaced as follows, the penalties for violation. Number one, any person, firm, corporation, or title owner who violates the provision of this code shall be subject to a civil fine of not less than $100 per day by, per violation, but not more than $500 per day per violation, or the cost to the city of Beaverdam to abate the violation or both. Each date that a violation of this ordinance continues after due notice has been served in accordance with the terms of this code shall be deemed a separate offense to a maximum of $15,000 per citation. As an additional alternative remedy to the above penalty, any violator who violates any provision of the city property code and has been previously issued two or more citations of violations of the city of Beaverdam of ordinances related to the same property within a 12-month period may be assessed additional civil penalties of $500 per day per violation to a maximum of $30,000 per citation. The city shall possess a lien on all property for all fines, penalties, charges, attorney's fees, and other reasonable costs associated with enforcing this code and is placing the lien on the parcel of real property pursuant to the code. The next one is 106.4 which the violation penalties is not adopted. And that it just spells out a different process than what we normally do. Section 107, 
sections 1, 2, 3, and 5 we are not adopting. And again, it, a lot of it is procedure, the way they do it, set up in orders versus the way we do it. A lot of talks about signage is put up and tampering with and what have you. And that's for residents? I'm sorry? That's for residents? Residential and business. Most of this is what we. Pretty convenient. It costs five hundred thirty thousand dollars for a residence. They need to make thirty thousand dollars a year. Well, all they have to do is fix the problem, and there is no everything goes away. Yeah, every every problem is real easy to fix. Well, if you're going to have a piece of property, you've got to take care of it. Well, won't y'all get some good jobs here? Well, take that up with the county. Let's see, where were we at? One on six. One on. Eight three. Mm -hmm. Get them for thirty thousand dollars in a year period. One oh eight three. Replace the section as follows. It's the notice. Whenever the code official has condemned a structure or equipment under the provisions of this section. Notice shall be posted in a conspicuous place on or about the structure affected by such notice and served on the owner of the person or persons responsible for the structure. If the notice pertains to equipment, it shall be placed on the condemned equipment. The notice shall be in the form prescribed in section 106 and served on the owner or responsible person with section 106. However, if the whereabouts of a person is unknown and it cannot be ascertained by a code official in the exercise of reasonable diligence, or the whereabouts of the owner is known and he or she refuses to accept personal service with a certified letter mailed to him or her, the code official shall make an affidavit to that effect, and thereafter further notice may be served on such persons by sending a copy of the same by regular U.S. mail to the person's last known mail address as recorded in the PVA or by newspaper publication. One oh eight four. With respect to structures that violate the subsection upon failure of the owner or personal person responsible to comply with the notice provisions within the time given, the code official shall post on the premises a placard bearing the following language. This building is unfit for human habitation, occupancy, or use. The use or occupation of this building for human habitation, occupancy, or use is prohibited and unlawful. With respect to defective equipment, upon failure of the owner or person responsible to comply with the notice provisions within the time given, the code official shall post on the equipment a placard that the equipment is defective and should not be used and or may have the equipment rendered inoperable until such time as it complies with code. 10841 is still all part of the placarding. The code official shall remove the above reference placard whenever the defect or defects upon which the placard and action were based have been eliminated. Any person who defaces or removes a condemnation placard without the approval of the code official shall be in violation of the Kentucky Penal Code and subject to immediate arrest and applicable penalties. 108.5 changed the original to any person who shall occupy placarded premises or shall operate placarded equipment and any owner or any person responsible for the premises who shall let anyone occupy placard premises or operate placard equipment shall be in violation of Kentucky Penal Code and subject to immediate arrest and penalties. Let's see, 109.5. Cost incurred in the performance of emergency work shall be paid by the city. The city may recover these costs by filing a lien on the property on which the emergency work was performed, and it may recover those costs by foreclosing on this lien or by taking other appropriate legal action. Does that pertain to fire views in the event there be a fire? I'm sorry? Would that pertain to fires in the event of a fire? Would that be, would that reverse due? Or would no. fire dues not cover that? So, fire dues. Emergency services, that's what I'm asking. Well, fire dues is only if you live outside the city limits. If you live within the city limits, you don't pay fire dues. Okay. So, and this is all just strictly inside the city limits. Do we have a copy of this for anyone to have? Well, we don't have it tonight, but there's a you can do an open records request and they can get you one printed up. Okay. 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 110.02. Yep. Notice and orders. 
All notice and orders shall be issued and served in the same manner as is set forth in section 108. And 110.4. So on salvage materials. When any structure has been ordered, demolished, and removed, the city commission or other designated officer under contract or arrangement shall have the right, but is not required, to sell the salvage and valuable materials at the highest price obtainable. The net proceeds of such sale after deducting the expenses of such demolition and removal and after the payment of any liens, fines, or taxes owed to the property shall be promptly remitted with a report of such sale or transaction, including the items of expense and the amounts deducted for the person who is entitled thereto, subject to any order of a court. If such a surplus does not remain to be turned over, the report shall so state. And then 111, this is a different appeals process that has been taken out altogether and or not adopted. <coughs> Now, all this stuff, David, have we ever done a condemnation mm, through code enforcement? Not through code enforcement. There was the one on rendering that the city did. Well, that's, uh, yeah, a separate animal with what happened there. So all this stuff is stuff that, when I say through code enforcement, we've never had, we've never incurred or had happen here. That's why we're trying to make some of these a little more palatable, but it's, it's still part of the thing to try to keep it from happening here. Okay, 112.4. And it just adopts the penalties of the 500 and 1,000 for on the condemnation side for a stop, failing to uh, agree to uh, uh, honor a stop work order. Now, this gets into the dwelling parts, the definitions. Like section 302 is exterior properties. It talks about sanitation, drainage, sidewalks and driveways, weeds, road and harborage, exhaust fence, accessory structures, motor vehicles, and defacement of property. And the first one is section 302.4. The weeds, we have to put in something in there, and 10 inches is what we've had all along on our, for quite some time. Section 302.8 is re basically replacing what's in theirs with this one says it shall be unlawful for the owner occupant or person having control or management of any premises residential or non-residential to permit an inoperative or unlicensed vehicle to be parked kept or stored on the premises visible from public right-of-way no vehicle shall at any time be in a state of major disassembly disrepair or in the process of being stripped or dismantled again viewable from a public right-of-way Painting of vehicles is prohibited unless conducted inside an approved spray booth. Exception, the exception is a vehicle of any type is permitted to undergo major overhaul, including body work, provided that such work is performed inside a structure or similar enclosed area designed and approved for such purposes. Minor repair work may be completed on a vehicle within the view of public right-of-way, provided the repair work is completed the same day and vehicles not left overnight in inoperable condition. <clears throat> Section 302.10 is added and entitled Equipment, Vehicles, and Scrap. It shall be unlawful for the owner, occupant, or person having control or management of any premises, residential or non-residential, to permit a public nuisance, health hazard, <coughs> or source of filth through the accumulation of junked, wrecked, scrapped, or inoperable automobiles, vehicles, machinery, junked or inoperable lawn equipment, or other similar scrap or salvage materials. Exception, an exception applies to a commercial enterprise who has received approvals from the uh, Hartford Beaver Dam Joint Planning and Zoning Commission to operate such a business. However, all planning and zoning regulations must be adhered to, and any such junked, wrecked, scrapped, or inoperable automobiles, vehicles, machinery, junked or inoperable lawn equipment, or other similar scrap or salvage materials must be kept within a secure, fenced area and shall not be visible from public right-of-way. Uh, 303 discusses swimming pools. Uh, 3031 is remaining. Swimming pools shall be maintained in a clean and sanitary condition and in good repair. Section 303.2 on the enclosures is not being adopted under this because it'd be redundant because that is under the current planning and zoning regulations on fences around pools. 304.1. Clarify. Oh, 
said it was not adopted through oh, in, court. Yeah, it's uh, insect screens. And this talks about the ventilation of homes and stuff on having to have a screen and all that kind of stuff, and we did not adopt that. And then 308.2. Through some of the rest of this talks about uh, th this whole section on 304 is exterior talking about unsafe conditions it talks about foundations and walls and roofing and veneer and uh, overhangs and exterior exterior stairs decks porches chimneys and that have you protective treatment uh, structural members, foundation walls, exterior walls, roofs and drainage, decorative features, overhangs, stairways, chimneys. And 306 is component serviceability. A lot of that is concrete. And 308.2.2, refrigerators. This is sections being replaced as follows. Refrigerators and similar equipment not in operation shall not be discarded, abandoned, or stored on the premises without first removing the doors. Additionally, no refrigerators or appliances intended for indoor use shall be outdoors within public view of the right-of-way. Three hundred eight point four. Insert. This is a new section. No owner of any dwelling shall allow the placing of any furniture not originally sold new for outdoor use on the exterior of a dwelling. Three hundred nine talks about pest elimination with rodents and rats and what have you. Chapter four is all about ventil lights, ventilation, occupancy limitations, and most of that's interior stuff that we wouldn't be affected by anyway because we do not enter. Chapter 5 is plumbing, fixtures, and fixture requirements. And number 502.6, this section and its heading shall be added as it followed. All residential dwelling units and all non-residential units equipped with such facilities are required to have running water provided by a public water system. 6.30. And chapter 6 deals with the mechanical and electrical requirements, uh, 6.21 is changed. The heating facilities shall be provided and structures as required by this section. Every residential and commercial occupancy shall have a permanent heat source. A permanent heat source is one in which the power source is either hardwired or piped into the appropriate utility. Uh, and that gets away from wood heaters put in mobile homes, that gets away from open flames but again a lot of that is interior so that's only affected if there is a complaint 602.3 talks about the dates and stuff and that only applies from September 30th through May 31st and then the others yeah through May 31st so that's and then the last section of electrical tank was the last. That's the so last. So that there, you can't have ventless heater or gas log? Yeah, you can do that because they're produced they're from and manufactured for that purpose. I'm sorry? They produce wine. It's still manufactured for that purpose. We've had some issues with uh, wood stoves and fireplaces being built inside of some mobile homes. So far, everything you've said sounds about like what we've already got on the books. 90% of it is. So the, what are we changing? Is because the books, on the books, it's nuisance. And what some people claim to be a nuisance, others don't see as a nuisance. So we're going by this property maintenance was has uh, been put together. It's been accepted internationally with this property maintenance code. And we were just approving it to solidify, solidify pretty much what we've got and get some teeth to it. Because right now... I say, if David goes out and does something, it's like, well, you know, just because I got all these junk cars out here, I don't think it's a nuisance. Well, your neighbor, neighbor may feel differently. Yeah. Uh, are you inspecting the inside now as well as outside? 
No, we're not doing anything inside right now. Okay. Then you said that you would inspect inside if there was a complaint. Well, if, if a homeowner calls and complains about an inside violation, we can. What if it's a tenant? Tenant, yeah, we can. Because they're legally... What about if they're not compliant, they're not date? There's a reason. I'm sorry? What if they're not current with their rent? That's something that code enforcement will have to work out with the property owner. Yeah, yeah, because if you have to evict somebody and they know, well, first thing they're going to do, they're probably going to turn the water faucets on, let them run, and then we get into the other deal. And then they're going to call and complain about all kinds of stuff, which, well, you know, and if somebody, you, and then if somebody you, is three months behind on the rent, you're probably going to ask them to move, and you're not going to do a whole lot of repairs in the meantime. And, and that's first why. Thing they're going to do is run down here. Well, but they're going to have to have some legitimate reason. They can't just come up here and say, they're throwing me out. I want something done about it. Is there some kind of? Are we have we added any kind of inspection fee or anything? No. Okay. Are, are you going to charge them to come and do something? Because they're not paying. They're not paying us as the landlord, and they're not paying their utilities. So once their things get cut off, and they're not paying rent, and we're getting them out, then they're going to come and complain to you that. We've done something wrong when we haven't done anything wrong other than them not paying rent and not taking care of the place. Well, but that can be handled with one phone call from code enforcement to the owner of the property. It's like, <coughs> here's what we've got. And if you tell him that he, rent had been paid for two or three months, that's the first thing we're going to do is like, well, until so you're... He's going to he's he's come to us prior to oh, yeah. the day yes. say, hey, what's going on with this tenant or this property or yes, whatever? Yes, they will... The, the property owner will be contacted. So basically what you're doing is just putting teeth in a code enforcement. That's what we're doing. Because we've had a lot of issues right now where, like say, it comes in and it's like, well, they don't consider that a nuisance. Yeah. And, and say you do have somebody turns water on on your kids. Say they have three months. You said three months. I'm going to use that. Say they're three months behind on their water bill. And you go and the code enforcement goes back and he says, two months, three months ago it was this. Two months ago it was this. And now it's way up here. Well, you know they have gone in there and done that. That's not going to be. They won't that, even. They won't even have water by that. Point, yeah, though. they will. They'd be in big trouble, and they'll give you a right to get rid of them because he can actually say. Well, He's you know, the state of Kentucky doesn't require. If you want to evict somebody, state of Kentucky doesn't require a reason. All you got to do is in thirty days notice. Yeah. Period. Yeah. But you got to. Well, you don't even have to do that. I just found out if your lease is written right. But anyway. Okay, so you're just basically changing the, putting teeth in. We're putting teeth We're into it wording and right. putting it up in something that's recognized internationally as far as the type of ordinance it is. Well, it, I, don't, I don't know if y'all do it, but I know that Hartford does it. Like, if we rent something, you'll have to have our lease agreement before you turn the water on for yes. that individual. Yes. It's if you know that, will you contact the landowner that they're not paying their water bill? But generally, we don't know until months down the road. And then they're financially responsible for it, right? That's where what we do when they come in there, we, we have very little grace period because it's turned off pretty quick. I know that, but we never know that. I mean, well, you'll, I, you'll get word when it's turned off. Yeah. Do what now? You'll get word when it's turned off. I, yeah, the, will contact the property owner will be contacted when it's turned Harvard off. Do yeah. Hartford is different than Beaver now. Yeah, yeah Harvard, Harvard is different. Contact the landowner. Now that's one of the things we discussed in this last thing with the water. That if that's the case, the con the owner will be contacted. That's good. And we cut down the time that you have to do it, so it's not as long and drawn out. It's a shorter period, so they don't have as many days to run your water bill up. If that was the case, they, before they get it cut off. What did y'all find out on the cut off date? It's it's still yeah. in the air because there's some legal stuff yeah, that we're running into. Yeah, but it's, it's going to be closer to. Well, when you when y'all said the level, whatever it was, I didn't figure that that was too quick. I didn't figure that was going to happen. Somewhere in the middle, Mike. Yeah, somewhere in the middle. I got a question for you, Paul. Yes, sir. You mentioned a while ago did a lien against a piece of property. You can force foreclosure on it. Mm -hmm. How are you going to do that? Well, I'm, I'm just I'm just curious on how you take a lien and then force a person to, uh, or how you foreclose on that person. Just file suit to foreclose yeah, on the lien. The it sells yeah. at the courthouse door. Didn't you say also that your all's lien for code enforcement would take precedent over any existing mortgage on it? No, no. any subsequent oh, lien. Subsequent. 
yeah. except for and, taxes. Yeah, taxes like city and county taxes and the school mm -hmm. tax and all that. And uh, you said something about <clears throat> the emergency services thing. Uh, just kind of missed part of that, I think. Uh, you said that you all would come back to recoup that from the property owner. Mm -hmm. A lot of what that is, that's not going to be what you're thinking, like fire related or anything like that. What that is, is if you have a dilapidated building yeah. that's going to come down and it's going to cause a public safety issue, mm -hmm. and it's, you will not do nothing about it, the city has to come in and remove it. Yeah. That's what would be considered an emergency service. Cool. Oh, you're sign thinking sign emergency sign. fire. Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, this is yeah. We had a tree fall out mm -hmm. up here. We just got through doing this. So. Yeah. yeah, still in the middle of it. Yeah, we're, yeah. 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 Sure. we had a tree fall right on top of a mobile home and just basically split it in half and everybody just left. Yeah, it's been three, mm -hmm. three years? Is it three yeah. years? I don't know what house you're talking about. I do too. Yeah. So how did you work that out? I mean, it's well, still the, the problem we had with it, the, the owner died and, and the people that inherited were both minors yeah. and in state custody and trying to find them and locate them. So, but we're doing a condemnation on it. But it didn't come under code enforcement. It comes under another one in the city. Okay. Whenever you're condemning these properties, you all are just putting them at the courthouse steps to sell? Mm -hmm. so. What's the timeline on that? As far as like, if you condemn something, how long does that take before you decide to sell or have you done it before? Yeah, we've done some. Okay. Uh, a lot of times it takes up almost 90 days or longer. Okay. Because there's a, the process, like on the, the just the code enforcement issue, when it's issued, they've got a notice of violation goes out if there's not been an issue before. You've got seven days to remedy and con or contact. And that's one thing that we've got to be clear on. If you get a notice of violation on something going on, all it takes, because we don't want the property, we don't really want the fines, we just want stuff cleaned up. If you get a notice of violation from code enforcement, you've got seven days to do something in. A lot of times if you'll call David and say, hey, here's what we're looking at. We're planning on this, this, and this, but it's going to take us a little longer than seven days. I know you've given them, what, yeah. 30 and 60 days on stuff to get, you know, get stuff fixed. Effort, right? As long as there's been progress. As long as progress, like I say, is being made. But then after that, once you get the notice of violation, there's another 10 days to go in there to have a hearing or anything before it can go any further than that. What do the fines, funds go to? Just general funds? They'll just go to general fund. But now... I was trying to think, I don't think we've even, last year, maybe two or $300. Again, it's We're not about the money. Very minimal. Usually everything gets worked out. Everything usually gets worked out before there's even a citation issued. But we're ha like I say, we're having a lot of issues with stuff that's gray area, I guess. But some people think it's a nuisance, some don't. So what we're doing is spelling it out so everybody knows what's... You know, that's why, like, we changed this in here. Say you've got a car that's a couple years old and belonged to your mom and she's in the hospital or nurse home or something, and it's not licensed. All we ask is pull it around back or in a garage or something. Uh, we don't want one sitting out on blocks. You know, again, just take it around back. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of stuff we're looking at right now. And you know, it's getting in a lot of the, a lot of the houses. We've got some houses, I'll tell you, that's got gutters hanging off of them and windows broken. In fact, I would even go so far as to say the city has some property that doesn't meet some of these codes right now that we've already been addressing with our city employees. And it talked about putting up the fence around, like when you have a junkyard or something, and you have cars out there that are being worked on. That's that's not our law. That's state law. They're all supposed to have that. So it's not something we put into effect. It's something the state has put into effect. I have a question about gutters. So if a gutter's hanging down, you can just take it off. Right. There's no gutter on there. I, yep. We're not going to. Because that's a major problem with rentals because a renter is not going to clean the leaves out of the gutter and then it's going to fill up and probably it's going to, yeah. you know. But you can just take it all the way down and not have the gutter. We just want the neighborhoods to be something if you wouldn't care to live next door to it. And there's some places in town that I wouldn't want to live next door to. I mean, I've got no problem with code enforcement because if somebody's got a junk car in the yard, instead of me having to go and jump on and be the bad guy, just say, get rid of that code enforcement. Come right here and get me. Yeah, get you. I have to pass it on. Yeah. And it works better than me just rocking that all. As long as we're not getting into something where 
somebody's got to come in and you pay them a hundred dollar inspection fee and they tell you when to put your ground countertops on when you got to paint the inside when you got to change the carpet and all that kind of job that's not being done right now not right now but i will tell you there are a number of cities that do have oh, and, and it's a little it's not quite what you're talking about they had the rental inspection programs where uh, some of them have rental inspections once a year well, uh, most of them I've talked to try to do it when between occupants. Yeah. Most of them are, mar are major cities, though, right? No, no. The, 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 the toughest one in the state of Kentucky is Fulton, Kentucky. It's where? Fulton, what Kentucky. Population? About 1,300. 1,300. What's Fulton. the annual salary? In Fulton, Kentucky, it'd be lower than here. I don't know. There's nothing. It's about as far away as you can go. Yeah. On Tennessee line down there is nothing. Tennessee, <laughs> Tennessee it's, it's a very rural, rural place but what they do and what they look at when they go in is do the, the light fixtures are up there do they work uh, do the outlets work on an oven does it still work do the burners work uh, does it have the GFI in the bathroom is you know are the, the windows in place well the windows open because that's state six o'clock well I mean you shouldn't have to do that. The renter is going to want that done to start with. So, well, that's most of them. Anyhow. We're we're just taking baby steps, and that's what we're doing. This first thing to try to get this stuff well, cleaned I up. Got, if this I, takes care of everything. We won't have any problems from us. What you said so far, I've got no problem with, as long as it don't become a slippery slope and get into the to the other. Well, I mean, when you know, that takes all you last year, and I called oh, you about it, and I thought it was ridiculous. Who me? Yeah, you remember oh, that thing? Yeah. yeah. No. And I told you I thought it was ridiculous, and I wasn't gonna. I wasn't gonna. There was no way I was gonna have you fined for that. That wasn't even your responsibility. But we had got cleaned up. No big deal. Nothing was done. And I, you know, there are leeways and things you can do to make things. It shouldn't be a fight between the homeowners and the renters and everybody else and the city. It should everybody be getting it taken care of. Well, that guy was a nut. He got he, leaves he, over on that piece of property and set it on fire and I had in your yard. Up there. In, huh? in your yard. Yeah. I know. <laughs> if anybody should have got fined or arrested, it should have been right. him. Travis, to answer your question, I looked it up real quick. This is data, the last thing that's been published in 2020. In Fulton, the median household income is 29.4. Well, that is maybe higher than here. No. Yeah, the median is 40 something. Oh, 43 years. I didn't realize it's 43 years. Uh, yeah. It's 23 years. Huh? 23. That's in Bolton. Yeah, this is in Bolton. Years. Years 23, 29 Bolton, is what you said. Yeah, Travis asked what the median income was in Bolton. So it is higher here. It is higher there than it is here. Yeah. I think that 43 is something that's bigger than. Here it's 23. No, not median. Yeah. Years ago, it was 25, but that's when we were grandfathering, and that's even. We just, I just had it pulled up from Parker Grant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it basically what it comes down to? Who your name was? Who was on the code enforcement no. board? You said there was a board. Is it just you all? No, there is a board. No, it's board. It's not. Well, the reason I'm asking is several years ago, we was uh, forced to get rid of a vehicle. And I, I'm not saying that it wasn't an old vehicle and stuff, but we was forced to get rid of it. It belonged to my wife's father who had just passed away. And they they come down there two, three times, you know, and uh, upset her and stuff. So I, I ended up coming down here. But anyway, that, this is back when Freeman was doing it. And Freeman... Staples. Oh. Staples. Uh, but uh, in a 12 block area here in town, I rode around and there was a dozen vehicles looked just as bad as that one and been sitting longer. None of them, none of them was moved. So that's really nice. Yes. Is it depends on who your neighbors are. You said it's by complaints. Most yeah. of them are taken by complaints, but it can be taken, and, and that's one thing that will happen that we've talked about. We're going to be doing a little more patrolling on our own. Well, I mean, you know, without complaints, it, but if if it was done fair, yeah, I, I wouldn't call anything about it. But I was, we was the only one that was targeted. We was the only one that had to move the vehicle out of all of them. Now, that's not right. 
No. No. But if if some of the other ones had to move theirs, I would understand mm -hmm. me having to move mine. You know. But I, I didn't think that was right. The way it went. Right. That came down probably, and, and I don't know, but that probably came down under, uh, I don't know why anybody would have a complaint if there's a bunch of others in the same neighborhood. Well, Mr. Staples told me, which he said, if you want some of them moved, complain about them. I said, well, then that wouldn't make me any better than the one that complained about mine. Well, what should have happened in a situation like that where a complaint was made and they found that to happen, there's, that's when the officer should start looking around yeah, the same I, area. I told him it was within 12 blocks, but they were still sitting there. Some of them still are. So, and this was years ago. Yeah, because he's been gone. Yeah, it's been a while. But uh, that, that was he was any of that. that. I think I had some. I don't know the name. Down I don't recognize it at all. Michaels. Oh, oh, my oh, God. God. oh. I, I guess I had some neighbors that was, didn't like to be nickel more than some. <laughs> Sorry. So Paula has brought up at the meeting last month or whatever, and I heard a little bit touched on it there. Have you found out any more of the legal aspects of like kicking somebody out if they don't have their utilities? We can do it on water. We can do it on water. Yeah, if it's water, we can't. Within fifteen days. We can. Because it's a health and has a health hazard. Still do it within 15 days. That's well, you're checking on that thing. Mm -hmm. that I'm talking good? about that's when the water is turned off. Yeah. He's talking about if there's, and I know of a couple places in town right now where there's people living, but they don't have a water service. Yeah. Isn't that automatic eviction? Well, it will be with this. Yeah. But it's not. What's the timeline? Does it follow all that 90 days with no water? Does that mean if you don't have utilities in the building, that's kind of automatically condemned, isn't it? No. Not water. Okay. Are there penalties to any landowner if they have tenants and something, then they leave if it's vacant? Do they still have to keep water off? No, no. not this, not no, no residents there. No. no. The reason I asked that, I'll just tell you all. I mean, I think it's a great idea because I bought a house over at Harper just to, you know, to sell, fix up and sell. After we got it done, the people next door. I realized I didn't have any water, and they were stealing water out of my tap outside. <laughs> so I turned the tap off, the outside hyper. Well, I really screwed up then, because then they started getting in the house. And once they got in the house, then they started taking showers and doing their laundry and everything else. So I think it's a great idea. Oh, you, you need some cameras in that house. Y'all good? Play everything right now. Like I said, it's self explanatory pretty fast. Okay. Well, I just want to go through everything line by line and make sure everybody understood on the same page. And like I said, we're not acting, we're not doing anything tonight with this other than we were going to go through a work session where everybody could talk it through. And you know, uh, I'm one of these, I don't know we would have had to, but I wanted to be up on the front, up and up. We're not trying to slide anything through or hide anything. This is a whole, most of this is a whole lot of what we already have on the books anyway. This is just going a different route with this property maintenance code that has been accepted to where we have a little more teeth into it and get it done. And like you said, it's taken a lot of gray areas. A lot of gray areas out. Our ordinances are based off the International Building Code. All right. But they're considered a nuisance, nuisance. ordinance versus a city ordinance. Mm -hmm. And that's where it gets a little bit more teeth in it. Well, it is ammunition for the landowner, I mean, the homeowner, to do whatever needs to be done because it's right there and right mm -hmm. now. How long is it going to be before you get this in the work before you kick somebody out that's there? <laughs> <laughs> I got one too. <laughs> oh, 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 that's an electric. If the electric's cut off and they can't charge their phone, they're gone. But they'll pack water forever. Yeah. That's what we're finding. <laughs> you know, it, it only takes, now with the new toilet, it only takes a couple of gallons. <laughs> <laughs> what worries me is the ones who just flush once a day or every couple of days. <laughs> yeah. That's another sad situation. Okay. 
Well, I'm going to turn the motion to adjourn. Is this going to full effect or is that to be voted? Well, it has to be voted on again. The next city commission meeting is April the 10th. But we want to do this at the meeting. We just vote it.